Let's begin exiting the ASAP lane with Alan. Hello everyone, uh, this is Alan Steelman and do we have an exciting program for you today? How about this one? I am not your opinion of me. And that this program today is about what I like to call our biggest bully, the one thing that can handicap us for life, and that would be our self-limiting beliefs. These voices in our mind that are constantly sabotaging our dreams and hopes for a better life. And you know, these often come from events in life when someone we knew expressed a very negative opinion about us or said something that was really demeaning that we have internalized and has become a part of our accepted life narrative. These toxic beliefs, which frankly afflict all of us, telling us we're not worthy, we're not enough, how our dreams are all way too grandiose for someone of our limited skill and ability, these crippling beliefs affect both men and women, but seem to be particularly acute among women, and what a powerful guest for this topic and for today's show. If you'll follow her guidance, you can KO that bully and bring new energy, purpose, and balance to your life. Jacqueline Hayes is a three-time author, a motivational speaker, and an empowerment consultant. She helps women to achieve leverage and self-confidence while instilling in them passion, focus, and commitment. Her professionalism and first-hand experience have been the sources of her deep knowledge, insight, direction, and understanding of issues in the corporate world, as well as the ability to impart people with excellence. Jacqueline leverages her wealth of experience of over 20 years in human resources and talent management in major industries, healthcare, telecommunications, and technology. Coupled with her fascination with human behavior, which enables her to connect people on every level and to empower them towards achieving greatness. She's written three breathtaking books to her credit, Unfolding, A Woman's Journey being the first, You Are Enough, A Guide to Love, Joy, Peace, Freedom, and Acceptance. And the third one being Blossom, Discover the Beautiful Flower Within, all available on Amazon. Her focus is geared towards living well, hence she offers the wonderful gift of making you believe in your innate, special, and unique abilities. Jacqueline is also passionate about enjoying life and making the world a much better place. She is committed to her mission of seeing others blossom and fulfill their potential. Welcome, Jackie, and many thanks for joining us today. Alan, hi. Thank you for the <laughs> opportunity to be here. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. Well, thank you, and so great to have you. So, you say in uh, one of your books that uh, many women waste their time defining themselves through the eyes of others. They are looking for answers from the outside, really to questions that should come from within. They're looking for acceptance and approval from individuals who do not have the power or the insight to give them such information. Could you please elaborate on that very profound statement? Yeah, that's a very interesting thing to talk about. Um, most people are influenced by what well, we are influenced by our external environment. We tend to shape our identity based on our external factors, our family environment, the people we associate with, our upbringing, the environment we grew up in. And so those things can kind of help us, well, not help us, but kind of serve as factors to help us start shaping our identity. And so we find ourselves defining who we are based on people, circumstances, and situations outside of us when really, when you take a look at it, which is what I've learned over my journey, is that who I am as an individual, as a human being, has a lot to do with how I look at myself and to start looking at myself from an internal perspective and asking myself, like, this source that created me, the source that created you, what makes me unique, what makes me special? And so what that does, it does two things. One, it takes the onus of other people getting to define who you are. And secondly, it empowers you, it empowers individuals, women, and other people to say, well, who am I specifically? Like, who am I uniquely? And um, understanding that by asking that question from an internal perspective, it gives you perspective, it gives you the opportunity to understand that you're beautiful, you're unique, you're amazing, and that your life has value. And these self-limiting beliefs can become bullies, can't they? Can become bullies. And the, and the bully lives inside of us. That's Isn't exactly that weird, right. right? For all of us. That's it's exactly like, oh. right. <laughs> you know, you, you, as a teenager, perhaps, uh, where a lot of bullying takes place, may have been bullied, and your life goes on, whoever bullied you leaves your life, and years go by. But these self-limiting beliefs never disappear, do they? Well, which, well, there is an opportunity to like put the bully to rest and like, hey, you're not going to just stomp all over my life, control me and dictate how I live my life. And we'll talk about some tools and things you can use to let the bully know like, hey, 
You're not going to just run over my life. You're not going to dictate to me and make me feel small and feel negative. I'm not going to do that. You can kind of just kind of dismantle the bully with a different set set of yeah. thoughts and beliefs about yourself. Well, I know I've heard you say that I just don't allow these people to invade my personal space with these opinions. And yet, as you know, so many do, and it does take a special form of resilience, I think, to be able to have that point of view. Could you elaborate a bit on how you're able to just shut them out and not, not let them uh, invade your space? Yeah, I think for me, what really worked for me is it's looking back at how I grew up my home environment. I grew up in an environment with two amazing brothers, just a nice support system. And in my home culture, in my home environment, there was so much... I was so nourished, so supported. Like my brother thought all my ideas were great. Well, when you go out into your school environment, your friends, they grew up in a different environment and they try to say, well, who do you think you are, Jagged, to think big? Or who do you think you are to do things differently? And that can kind of hit you in a way because you spend a lot of time time with your friends at school when you're younger, that they can almost influence how you look at things. But thank goodness. I had the gift of my brothers being totally amazing and um, so nurturing and so supportive. So when it came to individuals trying to define me to a degree, I have to say sometimes it would influence me slightly because you're around those individuals. But then I'm so grateful that my home environment where my brothers just thought everything I did was great. And so that outweighed the external influences yes. and also made me look at myself internally and think, OK, well, if my two brothers who are with me home all the time if they think i'm amazing then that must be more true yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that must be more true the people of my yeah. friends people and were saying. they two older brothers an older and a younger brother oh ah, you were kind of sandwiched between uh, good. I'm the you, only girl child you had, yes you had you had you had, uh, you had good protection so did you have uh, the kind of resilience today uh, as a teenager that you have today or was it, it was is this a learned ability you have in order to not let them invade your space I would say a learned and developed ability um, in terms of just understanding that. And it's just real, real clear for me in terms of being resilient is I'm just not defined by how you, your opinion of me is your opinion. My opinion of me is everything. And it just takes time to cultivate and practice that kind of healthy boundary in terms of how you see yourself and not allow a person's negative opinion of you, of me to shape and define who I am. Well, I know in one of your books, uh, you not only lay out the gospel on this, as it were, <laughs> but you also have very practical ways for people to adopt in order to manage their life in the way you describe. So, for example, the five powerful ways to nurture your mind, body, and spirit. Could you please talk a little bit about that? Yeah, a few things I mentioned in the book, You Are Enough, in terms of ways to nurture your mind, body, and spirit, which one that really saved my life is meditation. It's just understanding, like, getting to a point because I used to have this like this incessant chatter it's like who is talking and why we, are they always talking it's that monkey we're born with the right monkey yeah, exactly mind, right it's <laughs> like okay why are you always talking and why is most of the dialogue negative like this is right. so weird we can't be friends like this this is what I'm saying right. to my mind so meditation was one just getting some quiet time and I learned it from Deepak Chopra in terms of learning to listen to the quiet between the noise. I was like, Deep Rock, well, there's never any quiet. Where is that? Because right? so, that monkey never takes a day off, never takes a vacation, never goes to oh sleep. Oh my gosh, you know? he eats his bananas all the time. Exactly. And it's always uncontrolled. So meditation was one. The second thing, which I think is very healing and therapeutic, is journaling, being able to write the thoughts down so you can take a look at them and see if this really true. And if it, and how can I change it? Just taking a look at it by just putting it on paper. Um, another one is forgiveness, like for the people that you that we allow to kind of make maybe influences in negative ways, how to just forgive them because people kind of serve you based on where they are in life. So hurt people usually hurt people. Judgmental people usually judge people. Negative people usually try to put their negative thoughts on others. So having that thought of forgiveness, meaning I forgive you for what you said about me, but I'm not going to own your opinion of me and just kind of how to just kind of uh, mentally. That's interesting. Right. How to mentally right. to just kind of cleanse yourself in a sense through forgiveness so that you don't let them off the hook. You just get off the hook and you go on with your life. And another one is learning to set healthy boundaries. Yeah. Right. How to just you know how to have healthy boundaries with people. And one more is just developing healthy self-talk, the conversation within, learning to speak more healthy, nurturing words to yourself. Like, I love you. Like, you did a great job. The feedback is just an opportunity to be better. Like, you're on this amazing journey. Enjoy it. And just learning to just have a different self-talk. A conversation, right? In terms of what you say to yourself, speaking more loving, kind, healthy words to yourself. 
I hadn't thought about it, but forgiveness is an important, a very important part of this because when people say bad things about you, it usually makes us angry. We yeah. start carrying a grudge, right? And that does more harm to us than it does to the person. Well, because right? you own that person's opinion. So exactly. their negative comment of you. Now there is an opportunity if someone says something to you where it's like, okay, well, is that really true? Is it an opportunity for me to take a look at maybe how yep. I'm behaving? Yep. So, so is that a corrective um, type of? Situation of feedback where I can actually learn learn or grow from it. But if it sounds like ugly and toxic right. and naggy, it's like I'm totally going to have healthy boundaries and set boundaries where I'm going to cancel, disregard, and dismiss yeah. the toxic words. Yeah. Well, you mentioned meditation, and that is that is the most effective way to calm that monkey. Isn't it real? That yes. is the most effective way to calm that monkey. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've, I've thought often when I move on to my reward in the next life. Yeah. I'm going to ask St. Peter and the good Lord himself. I'm going to thank him for all the blessings. What in the world was the purpose of that monkey you gave me? I, that thing tortured me my whole life. I didn't deserve that. What was the purpose of that? What were you trying to teach that's me exactly, with the monkey, right? Oh, my that, God. That's, that's a great exactly question right. to ask. Yeah. But sedating the monkey, the best, most effective thing uh, is what Jackie just said, meditating. Uh, our God-given breath, uh, quieting the mind, being here now. Have you noticed that, Alan, just in terms of just your life, in terms of has meditation been a helpful practice? Absolutely, for you? and way, absolutely. It, uh, it's uh, it's a central focus. I do it uh, when I wake up in the morning and when I go to bed at Same night. Here. Absolutely, here. So it's it's extremely important, and especially life today in the digital age, which is so fast, and the news cycle is something new every day that keeps your head spinning. Right. So being able to. Uh, Calm down, quiet the mind, and know that this too shall pass uh, is an important byproduct. Take a few deep breaths. That's right. exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. So um, I thought it was n noteworthy that you did mention mind first, and that's a little bit a part of what we're already discussing, but mind, body, and spirit. So we're all born mind, body, and spirit. And uh, mind, you know, the, the purpose of yoga, for example, mm -hmm. as articulated uh, 1,300 years ago by Patanjali. He said the purpose is to calm the agitated mind. Mm. And then the Dalai Lama has recently said, if we could teach every 8-year-old to meditate, we could heal the planet of violence in one generation. I believe it. So what does that say? What it says to us is that, that uh, the agitated mind gives birth to anger, jealousy, and all the things that make all of us do things that we regret. Correct. And so if you can calm that agitated mind, then the spirit can do its work. You know, spirit, the spirit is where uh, uh, gratitude and joy and all our good qualities reside. Which I think is the essence of all of us. I it think is, the spirit I agree. is inside of all of us, yeah. But, but, but an agitated mind that is noisy all the time does not allow the spirit to, to do its work. So uh, I, I thought uh, it was very instructive you listed mind, body, and spirit Correct. as opposed to, because most of us, Especially in such a narcissistic world, tend to think, "Oh, I got to get my body right. You know, I got to dress properly and lose weight and do all the things." And those are all important things, but the mind comes first. The mind comes first. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, describe what you mean by life intentional thinking and how mindfulness plays into this. Yeah, life intentional thinking means from spirit, from the source, which my source is God, that I believe that my life has purpose, my life has value. And so I show, I show up like being here with you, having this conversation. I'm intentional. It's like, what can I do with my life to make the world a better place? How can I serve and be of service? So my life has value. I'm intentional how I show up. I want to take all my experiences, the good, bad, and ugly, and how it can pack those in a nice way to share with another person like, hey, you are having this experience, this journey, just like I am. Don't allow the overwhelming negative self-thought thought about your life experience to keep you from sharing your light, your gifts with the world. Because a lot of us allow our our negative self-talk to dominate us. where We feel like our life has no value, no purpose, no worth. And so we don't even try to operate from a place where we can serve, right? So being life intentional for me means I only have a short amount of time. Like I was born and then I'm going to make my exit at some point. So while I'm here in the gap, right. how can I do something awesome, delicious, and, and amazing, right? Well, you well, we've already talked a little bit about uh, positive self-talk and self-instruction and journaling. Could you elaborate a bit on a little bit more? I know you already referenced it a little bit. A little bit more on how important it is to acknowledge whatever is the difficulty in the moment with a journal 
and how you move on from that uh, into positive self-talk. Right. So for me, the power of journaling, I've been journaling for, for years. And for me, by... Do you mean literally writing it down or do you mean speaking to it and saying whatever's bothering you today is X, Y, and Z? Both. But I write it down. Like I have, I have notebooks of journals just from over the years, like, oh my gosh, over 20 plus years of just journaling, just getting stuff out of my head and just being able to get it out, like to download it out of my mind, out of my internal space and put it on paper it gets it out and it kind of creates this opening for me to have the opportunity to look at the situation differently, to maybe see where I might have exaggerated, I might be exaggerating and just going too far with it. And then to say, okay, well, is this really as big of a deal as I think it is? If, and if it is, how do I look at resolving it or get on the other side of it? Or if I'm exaggerating, how do, how do I just div- change my thoughts? But just by getting the thoughts out, journaling is super powerful. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Well, we've already talked about the monkey mind just a little bit and meditation. Are there specific meditation techniques to get to the practical side of this that uh, one some of our listeners might adopt uh, that you that you that you recommend? Okay, so when I started years ago, I tried so many different things because I wanted to just see, okay, well, what's right for me? What's right for my temperament? How how I'm wired? Um, and so. What I would recommend for someone who's just trying to figure out how to just calm down the monkey mind is just how to just sit and just focus on your breath. Like, you know, breathe in, breathe out and just focus on your breath. Move your attention to your to your to your your awareness, to your breathing. Inhale, exhale and just start there. Right. And just sit with yourself for a few minutes. And when you feel the need to want to go somewhere, get up or if your mind starts wandering, just bring it back to your breath. Like I'm focusing on my breath. In, I'm inhaling, exhaling, right? Start there. Very simple. And another practice to consider, which is totally doable. If you can't spend the first 10 minutes of your morning just having some quiet time meditation, just to thank God for a new day or just thankful for the gift of waking up and being alive because not every person got that option. It's like, how can I just spend five minutes, just some quiet time, just giving thanks for the opportunity of being alive, like right. still alive, right? Just right. start there. And don't complicate it, because I think you get so caught up on trying to do it right that you miss the opportunity just to do it and to experience the benefits of it. Right. Yeah. Well, I've actually talked on other programs about my technique, which is called the RPM method. Are you familiar with the RPM method? That is called rise, pee, and meditate. (laughs) <laughs> I have not. That's a good. That's a good way to. That's a good way to remember okay, it. You know, yeah, as opposed to rise phone and meditate, which is what most of us do. Right. Keep that phone right beside us. Yeah. It's rise p and meditate, people. So remember that. Yeah. That's um, cool. Yes. Yeah, so you you refer to uh, taking care of your temple. Uh, now you know in the Bible it talks about I believe the temple being our body. Are you referring to the temple as being body, mind, and spirit? I'm talking about the entire, the entire temple, yeah, yeah, mentally, spiritually, and physically, and mainly the internal components, your mental temple, your spiritual temple, which which impacts your external temple, your physical temple. Right. Yeah. Okay, good. You know, I was going to mention when we were talking about meditation, and it's an important thing for those of you who don't do this mm-hmm. and might just be starting up, the mind is going to wander. Yes. Now, and it tends to frustrate people. And they throw their hands up and say, I can't do this. I'm stopping. I'm going back to whatever I was right. doing it's before. It's not working. It doesn't work, whatever. And I know I, I've been, I would consider myself a very experienced meditator, and I bet Jackie does too. And believe me, that wandering mind is a challenge all the time. The it, monkey is always, that's, yeah. It's I, always, but always The working. more you do, you cultivate it, you're able to just bring yourself back to center. The more you just practice. Exactly. Have you noticed that as well, Alan? Yes, just, yes. Just, just making it a priority to just practice getting quiet and paying attention to your thoughts. Like, okay, Who's running the ship? Like who's in, who's running the internal ship? And realize we can't just have a wild monkey at the helm guiding the ship. That's exactly Otherwise, right. Your life would just be all over the place. And realize, yeah. okay, I'm in command here. I need you to get calm, get quiet, have a seat. We're going to get quiet and focus, right? Exactly. <laughs> And, you know, you can, uh, you may have seen pictures of people meditating in the lotus position. Mm -hmm. That's one way to do it. You can also do it seated in a chair. There's even something called mindful walking, where you're walking down the sidewalk, and as opposed to thinking about your next appointment, you're watching your legs as they move, you're you're feeling the the sidewalk on your, at the bottom of your feet. We should also eat mindfully. Yeah. I had to remind myself at lunch today to, to enjoy each bite. Enjoy, savor the taste, savor the the uh, you know the pungent aroma, and so forth. So, yeah. mindful eating, walking, as well as uh, 
sitting or in or uh, being in the lotus position. So, um, Jackie, you, you've talked about something called a heart tune-up. Could you talk about what you mean by that? Yeah, I think we should all consider doing a heart tune-up a few times. You're just kind of checking with ourselves to make sure our heart is good because it's so easy for the heart to become um, weighed down, toxic, or burdened by old thoughts, old experiences, where it keeps us from just purging those things and having the opportunity to just have a fresh new start. So one thing we could do is look at how to just actually – let go of old toxic feelings such as hurt, anger, resentment, and realizing if, so Al, let's say I'm angry with you from the conversation we had two weeks ago, and I'm still holding the anger in some kind of weird way in, way in my heart. Well, you go on with your life, right? For me, I'm holding on to that. It's unnecessary. Maybe you misunderstood or whatever. Um, just as an example, just how to just purge, release, forgive, and just keep your heart in a space where you're open to focus on the good things to flow in, right? Right. Well, everything you've said, based on my experience, would apply equally to men and women. But I know right. you spend a lot of time uh, with women in particular. Mm -hmm. Could you talk uh, with regard to women's empowerment? Uh, what are some of the characteristics of an empowered woman? Yeah, a few characteristics of an empowered woman is a woman who understands that her life has value. Like she's having this amazing experience or journey called her unique, beautiful life, meaning she's aware of her strengths her opportunities to grow. She's um, able to forgive herself, able to be patient with herself, able to be patient with others. She understands that she has something beautiful and amazing to offer the world and that she is a part of the human community, right? Like she is just a part of the whole thing, which is super beautiful. And so an empowered woman understands that her life is a part of the bigger picture of life and she knows that her life has purpose and value. Well, you know, the the last 30 years at least have seen major strides forward with regard to women's empowerment in a whole range of different ways, but there still is a lot of work to be done. Absolutely. So to talk about being a woman yourself. What sort of stereotypes do you grow up with when you're a young girl, for example? How do you figure out what kind of woman am I going to become? And what kind of people do I model myself after? And what are the negative forces saying, well, you can't be that. What are you, what's wrong with you? you? You can't do that. That's just for men. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many examples of that. Just for um, example, like I'm a first generation college graduate and just, I just had the desire. I just wanted to get a college education. It wasn't any big deal for me. I was like, I just need a college degree because it's going to afford me so many opportunities. And for for individuals in my home space who had not done this, go, why do you want to go off to college? It's like, well, because I'm not going to work at a factory or do in high school. I worked at McDonald's. I was like, for people working at McDonald's, it's great. But I was like, I just want to see if I can do more with my life. And people had their comments and feedback about that, but that was just something I wanted becoming an author. I didn't know how that was going to happen. I've made several mistakes, right? I've had lots of failures. I've had life just kind of feel like it just pushed me against the wall and made me say uncle almost because I'm good at going for big ideas because I, get this from my grandmother. I do believe that God is real. And if you ask that he's going to show up. And so you have to just kind of look at the people in my life in terms of me going big and wanting to do something in my life, because um, the stereotypes in terms of who do I think I am, it's like I'm Jacqueline Hayes. And that's the only thing that matters, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, I had a previous guest uh, two episodes ago, Deb Johnny Biswas, who wrote a book entitled, But You Don't, you don't Look Like an Engineer. <laughs> so she was a, a very bright, if not brilliant, woman from India yeah. who grew up with the stereotype that mathematics was only for men. Right. And if mathematics is only for men, that means only men can become engineers, right? Because mathematics is certainly one of the key foundations of being an engineer. But uh, her own father and mother would not let her live through the stereotype of what women at her age were being told they had to do in India. So she became a very accomplished engineer, and she's now a best-selling author and has found her purpose out empowering other women. So she can write her book like... She, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like that. That's amazing. Exactly. No, she, exactly. So uh, you, you use a phrase, uh, I support my sister. Now, I've read that women are often tougher on each other than men are tough on them. Or, in other words, competition with other women. That tends to be a, a, a challenge for most. Right. Would you elaborate on that on support yeah, your sister? Yeah, it is a challenge, and I think at the same time it's an opportunity. Like women who feel the need to compete with other women, then they're not clear about their unique value. Like I don't have to compete with another woman because only I can do 
what I do. Like, I love Oprah, right? Oprah is like the best, right? But I'm not trying to be Oprah. I'm just trying to be my best version for myself, right? And for women who have the need to compete with other women, it's just an opportunity for a woman to figure out how to just love herself more and realize that she does have something to offer the world and that we are in this together, right? Okay, great. Um, so we're coming to the close here, and I want to... Uh, that is so much fun, uh, Alan. Well, it, I, I know. Well, it is, and I hope, uh, and I know that our listeners are <laughs> not only enjoying it, but are going to profit by it. So your overall umbrella theme is you are enough. I think, would that be accurate to say yes. that? And so please elaborate on healthy self-esteem and self-confidence and self-awareness and there's no more excuses on your power. That's a direct quote from one of your books. Right. Yeah. And in the book, You Are Enough, I talk about the title speaks for the entire book, meaning who you are as an individual, meaning the source that created you did an amazing job. You have your unique set of experiences and that's enough. Like you have no need to try to be someone else because this is what you have to work with. Right. And so you ask yourself, well, who am I? Why am I here? What should I be doing with my life? Ask that to God, your source. It's like, I, I want to offer something good to the world. I want to enjoy my life. I want to help as many people as I can. And I want to have a very enriching experience. So when it comes to self-esteem, self-confidence, it's understanding just on a very simple level. You are enough. Your life has purpose. Your life has meaning. And that you're worth it. Yes. And that you are not the opinion that anyone else has about you. Yeah, right? I am not your opinion. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. Well, I know that uh, there's been uh, so much of this that can be adopted uh, by our listeners in their own personal lives. And Jackie, I really want to thank you for taking time out to be here today. It's such an important topic. It's been full of practical techniques that can be adopted. And as I said, she's got three books that can also be found on Amazon. So if you want to dive deeper, and she's also got a website. Uh, what's your website, Jackie? Right. So my website is JacquelineHayes.World, J-A-C-Q-U-E-L-I-N-E-H-A-Y-E-S.World. My books are on the website as well. And she's a speaker. So and she can be speaker. found. <laughs> books are in person can be found there. So, yes. Jackie, thank you again. And with that, we'll close. And I look forward to seeing all of you on the next episode of Exiting the ASAP Lane. Thank you.